Okay, we are actually live now. So, hey, everybody, welcome. Hey. How's everybody's Monday? Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good on this end. No complaints yeah. here. Did we have a nice, uh, well, Mother's Day weekend? We did. I worked. Yeah. You worked. Now that, now that I'm in the restaurant thing, yeah, <laughs> I had to work. <laughs> <laughs> then I came um, home and I say I did my first saber, so I was pretty proud of myself. Um, oh, it looks like it looks like John is trying to get onto Wi-Fi to join us. Um, anyway, so this month on Wine Riders Wrap Up, we are talking points versus palate. And um, I expect it to be kind of an uh, enthusiastic chat because, you know, it's not at all a bit controversial. Not at all. <laughs> um, but uh, our guests today, I'm going to go left to right. So, Debbie, you are first. Debbie Giaquindo, the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, is a certified wine specialist and wine location specialist in port and champagne and has a background in travel radio marketing and community relations. She's also the author of Tapping the Hudson Valley, chairperson of the Hudson Valley Wine and Spears competition, and co-owner of Happy Bitch Wine. She's also my co-host on Wine for Bed Street, which is a free monthly wine education program. So hey, Deb. Hi, everyone. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Hey, Deb. Hey. <laughs> and next is... Jeff Kralik is an award-winning wine writer and blogger based in Houston, Texas. His appreciation for wine started while studying in Strasbourg, France, and blossomed as a high school teacher when he would spend his summers as a bicycle guide tour in Europe. Jeff has visited, often by bike, most of the wine-growing regions of Europe and U.S., and according to him, I am a storyteller. While I take my writing seriously, I try not to take myself at all seriously. Howdy, Jeff. Hi, guys. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. And my buddy, Nick Baru, is marketing and brand manager for two wineries in the Pacific Northwest. He began his career in wine down in Argentina, which I'm very jealous of, where he did marketing communications for a well-known Malbec producer. He holds his advanced certificate in wine and spirits from the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, and he is currently a WSET diploma student. Hey, everyone. Hey, Nick. Hey, Nick. Hey, Nick. And lastly, because we can't get John to get in here, we have Rick Dean, is a wedding photographer by day and a wine blogger by night. He focuses on food, wine, from the Charleston, South Carolina experiences, he enjoys learning about wine and sharing his perspective. So howdy, Rick, how are you doing? I'm doing hey, great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so John is trying to get his son to give him the Wi-Fi password, so hopefully <laughs> he can all join in. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure this argument is doing well you know, in, in the soccer field, wherever he is. Yes, yes. Uh, gotta love, gotta love technology. Um, anyways, so today's episode, points versus palette. And this is something that is really near and dear, I guess, to me as a wine producer, because, you know, we, we are curious as to what gets people to recognize a wine. You know, uh, we send it out to wine enthusiasts, we get our ratings, which we love our ratings, they're great ratings, and we send, you know, we get people who buy our wine and write reviews, and we love the reviews, but what makes the difference, what makes somebody go out and say, hey, you know what, I haven't tasted that wine, but I want to buy that wine. So I thought this was a pretty good topic to go into. So just right off the bat, what's your thought of points? Let's start off with points. Can I go? Sure. Go oh, you know what? Um, I didn't even talk about what we're drinking, but we'll go points and then we'll do what we're we drinking. Okay. So, you know, I come at it from two sides. One is, you know, I work in marketing for two wineries. And so points are obviously very important. 
Um, but I think in general, points guide people. And I think the general wine consumer wants to be led. Um, I know that people have asked, you know, what's good? And I said, well, what do you like? Taste and it's kind of a cop out answer, most people think. And so I think those points kind of guide people. Um, either it helps validate their purchase or you know, for some, it's actually a, a status symbol, and so they just bought the, you know, the 100 point wine spectator. So, depending on the wine consumer's lifestyle, it serves lots of different purposes. Hi. Okay. Uh, how about you, in terms of points to you, Nick? What do you do? You. So I align myself with certain MWs, certain wine critics, and so based on, because I know that our palettes are very similar. And so I, you know, I'll look at what they've rated highly and certainly I will at least try it, but it's not my go-to. Um, you know, I'll, I'll always be adventurous and try something, but you know, again, I, I don't just blindly go off of a point, but I try to align myself with people that I trust and whose palette kind of aligns with what I like. All right. Jeff, you were gonna jump in before? Yeah, I would agree with uh, most of what Nick said. Um, I've gotten into heat, heated arguments with uh, a couple other wine writers about points. I use points on my site. I use a range of three points, but uh, truth be told, it's I start with the point in the middle and then I add two, uh, one on either side. Um, and I don't know why it's such a big deal uh, in in the wine industry. But there's certainly people who are really adamant that they they'll never use points that you can't put a point on to a, a a wine and i understand well i understand the argument in the abstract when it comes down to it we're always making decisions about good and bad um and so uh like nick said it helps it gives people a starting off point i mean that's i would argue that's at least for me that's what it's intended to do it's a starting point my father-in-law, who now lives within 200 feet of me, um, <laughs> this is my happy face. <laughs> um, he, he, he claims to be a wine drinker, and he drinks a lot of wine, but he knows absolutely nothing about it. But every single bottle that's in his shelf that I haven't given him, he'll know what the point score was. He oh. might not know how much it costs, he might not know, well, he definitely won't know who gave it the 90 points, but he'll say, oh, that's a 90 point wine. Um, so that certainly drives his purchases. So whether we like it or not as writers, consumers use it. And I would say being probably the least credentialed member of the panel as far as wine education goes, um, I come at it from a different point of view, but it's solely based on my experience. And I have had some really tough times buying wine based on points, but not having done any of the research beforehand, because at the time it didn't make any sense to me that I needed to know, well, what are the wines that this particular wine critic likes? Um, and which will then guide me as to why they have maybe have scored a wine the way that they did. And so I have no, I mean, I have no vested interest in points. I just find that they're not very useful to me. And for the average Joe and Jane that I communicate with through my blog and through my experiences with wine, the points tend to be confusing to them because they do not have the history and the background of what is wine spectator looking for? What is wine enthusiast looking for? What is Robert Parker looking for? Um, and so showing that something is 96 points only means something if you know what the guidelines were that that person was using to give it those points. And I think Nick hit a lot on the spot. I mean, I think it's subjective. It's, it's subjective to the person reviewing it. And like Nick said, that he aligns um, in his job up with people that have similar palettes to them. 
So I've gone into wine stores and, you know, oh, this is a 92 and I've, you know, points, whether it's spectator or enthusiast, and I've gone home and I've opened it and I'm like, how on earth can that be, you know, whatever the points are, you know? So I think it's really subjective. Well, on, well on you know, person. Debbie, because, because they bought a full page ad in that magazine. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, so I, I really think, you know, you have to know your, you know, the palette and, and, and the profiles that you like and align it with, with the wine. Do I think that, that the points matter to me? Not really, because I've liked an 88 or an 85 point wine over a 95 point wine. It, it's, you know. Who's judging these? And, and I run a wine competition, so I see on the other, on the flip side, you know how it's done, and I've judged so other wine competitions. So it's you know interesting to see, and I've watched other judges, you know, just take a sip and say, "That's an 85." Well, I, but I think it's also important that I mean we have to recognize that the points are a marketing tool. They are. But so, and so are competitions. And those are all good things, right? Yes. Marketing, marketing and competitions are good things. It, re, you know, it, it tells Dracenia Wines that they're making what many people consider because when you're entering a competition, there's more than just one person tasting the wine. Mm -hmm. You're saying that this group of judges really likes your wine and values it and thinks that it is a beautiful, Cabernet Franc expression from California. So and I that's, think that's important. And I do, I also think that's important. But for me, I mean, the lesson I had to learn was just because it had points didn't mean I was going to like it. And so I need to, I have learned, and what I try to always teach people is to lean on the people that you're buying your wine from. Buy from a reputable wine store or from a reputable wine company and lean on them for their experience so that when you pick up a bottle of 95 point something, they can say, put it back. You're not going to like it. Absolutely. It's, it's yeah. the salesperson knowing your tasting profile, what you like yeah. and what you don't like. Yeah. I would agree with both of you. I think, you know, when you look technically, you might have a hundred point wine, but if you gave me a hundred point Pinotage, it's not going to make it into my glass because I just don't, I've just never met a Pinotage that I really love. Um, and so it doesn't matter that it's technically a beautiful wine. Um, and, you know, through W said, I could taste a wine and be like, it is, you know, really great quality. Doesn't mean I'm going to like it, mm -hmm. but it would be, you know, a 100 point or 95 point wine just on its, on its merits. Um, and unfortunately it's just a hideous grape if we're talking about being Tosh. But. <laughs> well, 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 I agree. Well, I agree wholeheartedly with Pinotage and I would throw a few others in there like, like Chambersin. Oh my God. I would rather rip all my fingernails off than have another glass of Chambersin. But my, my question, and this is something I struggle with regularly because I'm frequently talking about this stuff around people like you, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all. Um, although after I finish this Pinot Noir, not Pinotage, I might feel differently. Um, but <laughs> so I, so I, I realize there's a continuum between wine geeks like us, or maybe even there's more people to one side of th that spectrum than us, and then my father-in-law at the other end of the spectrum. But where do w most wine consumers fall? Are they more like my father-in-law who say, you know what, what kind of wine do you like? Red. Um, yeah. Versus, you know, uh, versus what Nick just said, you know, if you give me a Pinotage, which I'm pretty sure my father-in-law would not be able to tell you what that meant. Um, they couldn't care. I mean, so we like to have these kind of, I come from academia and we have these, I was in a class once, we talked about the word the, for two whole days. And 
the only the people in the room and most of the people in the room well only the people in the room cared and most of them really didn't care at all um so so if we talk about you know the the, the differences between a 96 and a 94 or a 92 or as debbie said an 85 for the vast majority of the drinking public do do they care i also think price might fall into it too Sure. Right. Now, here's here's my question of those points going to a person who is just going into a wine shop and, you know, your your father in law who doesn't know wine, just I'm going to go in and I'm going to buy a bottle and I'm going to bring a bottle that I'm hoping Jeff is going to like. So I'm going to look at a point. Right. Do you, I mean, sure. that's what, that's what I think is those people go in and they look at points. And then what number is the, oh my God, I'm not even going to advertise that my wine got this number, you know, and what number is, yeah, I'm going to go promote all of this all over the place because there's, I've seen wineries promote an 85, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, is that, is that good? Is that bad? And then my other question is, well, the person who's giving that points, so just anybody in general, like Nick is saying, he's going to taste a Pinotage. It, he's, he may know it's not technically bad, but could you give that a 100 because you don't particularly like that, that wine? So the person who's tasting it, they can't really be in love with every wine, you know? And I think that that might impact what the score is for a wine and is that is that right well i think you have to determine whether or not the po the person who is assigning the point is basing those points it's my understanding that you know the robert parkers of the world are looking at that wine from is it technically made the way a California Cabernet Sauvignon is classically made. Is this the epitome of the technical aspects of a Cabernet Sauvignon from California or from Napa or whatever? Um, and that's different than whether or not he or she likes it. I well, mean, then how do you get how do you get a ninety eight, a ninety six, a ninety four if a wine is technically sound? Right. What makes the difference between a 98, a 96, or a 94 then? If that's oh, I, all that it's being on. Oh, I absolutely oh, agree with you, Lori. I mean, I've seen it range at one of my, at my previous winery where we had a 96, a 92, and an 89. And I'm like, huh, like, how does that work? And I've seen it at other wineries, not the ones that I currently work at, where, you know, across three or four different critics, it, it ranged and it was a, it was a big range. Right. And it's technically it's, it is the same exact wine. So technically sound, it's going to be identical for who anybody who tastes it. Well, and you would, you would, you would think so, but think about it this way. I mean, technically normally you send two samples. It could have had right. say an off day. Could have, or that person could have had an off day. Or that person could have had an off day. So or that person you know, who ate it, something beforehand. Mm -hmm. Or according to one of my friends that I just met on a recent uh, press trip, could have been a root day. Don't want to drink wine on a root day. A root day. Which, What's a root day? A, a root day, R-O-O-T. It's root. the biodynamics uh, um, calendar. Certain days are better oh. for tasting wines than others. Oh, oh, a biodynamic. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Boy, that throws um, a whole nother wrench into it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, to me, it, so, and the, Robert, putting Robert Parker aside, because, um, well, maybe not, I, so, I've talked to a lot of winemakers that say, well, this, they've changed their winemaking style because they know that it'll get them higher points. Yep. Um, and, uh, Laura, you said, you know, what's, what's the point where you start advertising about it? I've talked to many winemakers that, the difference between an 89 and a 90 is as big as you can get, right? Because, Massive. right? Because no one wants to be a B student. Everyone wants to be an A student, right? And, and, and that's why that was one of the brilliance 
the brilliant thing, what, why I think Parker, if he indeed started, was the first to use that, the scale, was brilliant because everybody can understand that, right? I mean, there are, there are other people who do different ways of rating wines that are more esoteric, that, you know, like five bells or five flowers or five stars or whatever. And, eh, you know, that, that's a little bit more. But the 100-point scale, or really it's the 20-point scale if we want to get real technical about it, um, is really easy to understand, mm -hmm. right? And even though you might not agree that said 88-point wine is worse than said 92-point wine, whoever made those two uh, scores does think so. And so in that person's mind, that one's better. So you say, ah, if they're the same price, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Debbie that brought up the price. Price plays an enormous, I mean, if you're gonna, if you, if you only have 20 bucks to spend on a wine and there's two on the shelf and one is a 90 and one is a 92, if you're the average consumer and you don't really, you're going in for something specific, to me, it would be silly for you to buy the 90 point wine. It would be silly. Right, I mean, that's my own opinion. It just, I mean, if if that if, the, if those parameters are such that that's that's the the, the situation, um, I, I this the same trip about the biodynamic. I, I was on a trip with a bunch of buyers to Italy. I was the only journalist, as far as I I knew, and they, I went around with a couple of them, and points were it. That was the driving factor. I mean, sure, this is a great wine. What kind of scores do you have? Um, and I was really shocked by that because every other press trip I've been on, I've been with other journalists, and that never comes up. I mean, that... Well, that would be a good article way. to write, Jeff. Yeah. But that's the <laughs> quickest way to shut down a conversation on a writer trip is if you want to say, oh, I got, I got 96 from Robert Parker on this. Turn everybody off immediately. <laughs> I... I go back, so Sunday, or not Sunday, Saturday, I took my mom out for her Mother's Day dinner or whatever, and we went to a restaurant. Um, Nick knows about the dinner. <laughs> um, Nick has inside information. That's Nick not has good. inside information. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I, I, I won't say the name of the restaurant, not that everybody's paying attention to the name of the restaurant, but complete sidebar. What I sent Nick the woman who was opening the bottle of wine um, had a very unique, and I'm using unique appropriately, Jeff. Um, no, not very unique. It's just unique. unique. Not very unique, just unique. <laughs> a unique way of opening the bottle. Um, she took the corkscrew, put the corkscrew in the bottle, and turned the bottle. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Slamming and, the neck would have opened it faster. And I, in my very quiet self, burst out laughing hysterically. Um, and I couldn't believe that she was doing this. And then she's trying to open it and it wasn't working. So she's continuing to bottle, to, to turn the bottle. Um, and ultimately, I just took out my phone and I started videoing her. Um, oh, see, oh, I, I, you're so cruel. cruel. I, you're so cruel. I would have said, you want me to handle that? Yeah, I winery. it wasn't my table. It wasn't my table that she was oh, opening okay. it for. Oh, okay. It wasn't my table she was opening it for. Um, so I, I would have walked over to that table and opened that <laughs> bottle of wine for her. Yeah. It's like, good God, I, please. No, I would have too. That's why I'm going to hell. You're going to heaven. I'm going to hell. I video you. See, I would. It would have been less rude in my mind to go over body check or send her to the floor <laughs> and just open it yourself. <laughs> That would have been less rude than putting her up on YouTube. <laughs> oh. So anyway, that was that was the sidebar. Um, and well, what made it even funnier was the wine that she was opening. That I won't share the name of the wine, but we all know the winery. That um, in fact, uh, we was it a Pinot Noir? Uh, no, it was what? a cab that we happened to have dinner at at the Wine Bloggers Conference. Okay. Um, in November. Um, anyway, so sidebar. Jordan? Was it Jordan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't have dinner there. Um, I'm going to have to tell Lisa Metz to that's all about I this. To Nick. I said I should send this video to Lisa. <laughs> you should. But you should anyway. know what the people are doing, you know. 
Right. Well, actually, no, because the wine wasn't sold there. Those people brought it, right? It was a BYO. No, no, it was it was an actual, it, it was not a bring your own restaurant. It, oh, well, they, she needs to know that their yeah. staff is not skilled in yeah. opening a bottle of wine. But anyway, so I'm watching, I'm looking at this wine list, and there wasn't a single Cab Franc on it. So, of course, uh -oh. I go to... <laughs> As Mike says, ABS, always be selling, always be selling. <laughs> um, so I went up after we went, after we were done, I went up and I asked if there was there a manager, was the wine buyer there or some, hey, somebody. And the manager, there was a man there and a woman. The woman was talking. The guy wanted nothing to do with listening to me. Um, and so I explained who I was, what I did. And then he was like, well, do you have a card? And I gave him my business card and he still wasn't too interested. And I said, well, we produce Cabernet Franc. We've gotten 91 plus ratings and wine enthusiasts. He became my best friend. Yeah. He like started asking me questions about the wine. He was like, here's my business card. Send me an email, blah, blah, blah. So points do matter. Points matter in that instance. Yeah. Points matter. No, I'm telling you with, with the, with the buying, with, especially with on the retail or the on-premise or, that makes it, I'm surprised at how much it does make a difference, but it's. Yeah. There are retail chains, um, one in particular, and I think they just changed their rules, um, that would not let you promote anything less than 90 points. And mm -hmm. on like your shelf talkers. And they said, nope, they only, you will only promote on a shelf talker 90 plus. So yeah, it happens. Well, and was that, was that Jordan Winery? <laughs> 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 um, I, I, you know, while points don't have much an influence on what I buy, I think points absolutely have their place for winemakers and for retailers and for restaurants because it's been a known process and a known uh, way to essentially categorize the quality of wine for, you know, a few decades. So, People need it. Where I find that it gets now, the grocery store owner or the Costco wine buyer is going to love points because they can have a 96 point Rioja for $14.99 in their store and people will buy it because it's 96 points and it's only $14.99. So while they need it, I also think that for the average Jane and Joe, it does them a little bit of a disservice because they may not even know what a Rioja is. They only see the fact that it's a $15 bottle of wine that has 96 points. And they're and buying that $15 bottle of wine because it has 96 points. Exactly. Exactly. So Costco needs the points to help sell their wine. Will the person who bought it like it? You don't know. You have no idea. Well, and, if it's, and if you're Jeff's father-in-law, it won't matter whether he likes it or not. It's got 96 it's points. 96 points. No, <laughs> no, it's right? I think to your point, Rick, he might like it more because it has 96 points. Exactly. So, yeah. And the other point I wanted to point out to you, Rick, is I, I don't know where you live, but you should be worried because that brick wall or stone wall behind <laughs> you is moving. Yes, <laughs> you might be having you might be having an earthquake on your hands. I just want to well, I don't know if you realize it. It is it is moving. It's a little warm here. I live in Charleston, South Carolina. The bricks we, are melting. The bricks are melting. No, actually, we are on an earthquake fault line, and we haven't had an earthquake since the seventies. Um, so well, you might be come. having one now because that thing is it moving around come. like nobody's business. <laughs> it could come any day, and I apologize for my moving brick wall. But you wouldn't want to see what's behind it. It's not nearly as pretty as Debbie's wine bottles or your bicycle or my green wall or Nick's refrigerator. I mean, it's just not. <laughs> hey, I was told to move, so I was in better lighting. So. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm going to take this as a break, and it is 8.30, and we haven't talked about what we are drinking yet. So I, I need to know what everybody is drinking. So I, I, I'll start off. Um, check out this label. Very wow. cool. Right? Looks like Britney Spears. Do I have Damn. to go get the bottle? I left the bottle downstairs with my husband. 
It does. This is a Funk Zone Rosé. It is a Santa Barbara County wine. 87% Grenache. I'll be right back. 13% Syrah. And this is actually a wine by Wink.com. Which is oh, awesome. I just heard I just heard an ad on by them by on uh, Sirius XM today. Oh, well, they are sponsoring nice. this little live stream podcast, and uh, if anybody, oh, that was them, nice. That was a little nice gratuitous uh, mention. It's actually a, a pretty awesome program. I don't know if you heard it on Sirius, but you know it's a wine club, not like other wine clubs, because you can not order whenever you don't want but you get four bottles four bottles in your box it includes shipping to your door and if you go to trywink.com which is p-r-y-w-i-n-c.com forward slash wrap up they're going to give you 22 dollars off of your first order so wow. you can get yeah you can get four bottles delivered to your door um for like i think it's like 25 bucks um but it's pretty cool you do this little questionnaire and they ask you these questions you answer them and they give you a palette profile and then you can pick wines that um that fit your profile or you can say no i'm not going to do that and i'm going to pick whatever wines i want so again trywink.com forward slash wrap up 22 dollars off and that's also. better than this i literally just saw listen to the ad on sirius xm i was i literally right before i joined this podcast and they're only offering twenty dollars off on this series. Whoa! Two so. extra dollars, baby. Washington, Washington, bam. <laughs> <laughs> or one Jefferson, or one Jefferson, I guess. Well, yeah, there's that. Yeah. All right, Jeff. So, what are you doing? Uh, he, so uh, I just polished off uh, Hank Skewis. Um, it's a Pinot Noir. It's a 2007 Peter's Vineyard. Uh, Sonoma Coast, I think, yeah. So it was signed by my good friends, Hank and Maggie. Uh, this is the last bottle. They sadly just retired, and so there'll be no more skewous wines available, um, but it was absolutely fantastic. Um, I've been a big fan of theirs for years. Uh, really, really nice people. And then since that was gone, I moved on to uh, Rodney Strong Reserve. There's like uh, Cabernet. Uh, that Rodney Strong, really great people. Really liked them a lot. Um, so that's what I'm drinking. And I actually have a Jordan Chardonnay in the fridge. <laughs> you want to not, turn the bottle to open it? Not, not that that's related to anything we're talking about because those it was supposed to go unmentioned, but um, yeah. <laughs> Debbie, what you got? I've got a Chablis. Uh, Bourdoin Millet uh, Chablis. Oh, Debbie, were you a French major? No. <laughs> oh, how could you tell? How could you tell? <laughs> Chips up a little tonight. I can't. I can barely speak English, let alone French or Italian. I was so, a French um, major, so I always loved the butchering of the French language. So, so uh, this the is French. 2015. Yeah. Um, and I, I must have gotten this. Um, I buy wines from Garista a lot. He's out in Seattle. I get a shipment twice a year, February and like October. Oh, the Gargeriste. Yeah, that person. <laughs> yeah, it's another French word, I understand. <laughs> Merci buckets, Debbie. Merci buckets. <laughs> uh, right, Nick. Did, Nick, I didn't see water, did I? So, you know, um, <laughs> life water currently, because I was. I don't, you are all on the, well, the middle or the East Coast. So I literally had to leave work early. I hope nobody at work is watching this so that I could be here by five. So by the time that I got in, got my computer set up, but I'll probably be having um, Hannah Chardonnay, Russian River Valley, um, with dinner, which is a pork tenderfoot. But it's important to note that he may not be drinking wine, but he's wearing Merlot. There you go. Right. You know? and so I, I was going to say the same thing that when you skip out of work wearing a Merlot t-shirt, they're pretty sure you're going to be drinking. So yeah, pretty much, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to say that I'm on the keto diet, but <laughs> I'm definitely not on the keto diet. 
Is that a French word too? I don't know. That. <laughs> Ask Debbie. I don't know. Yeah, actually, Debbie, how do you say that? I am drinking. Uh, I am drinking Teutonic uh, from Oregon Pinot Noir. It's from 2016. Oh, nice. It's really nice. I'm really enjoying it. Got it from one of my local wine stores. Um, we did a Pinot Noir tasting and where we were comparing Burgundy to the U.S. And so we were tasting Oregon, California, and a couple different appellations in Burgundy. And this was the representative from Oregon, and it showed really well. I like that Rick is drinking a Pinot Noir from Oregon, and it's not mine. Uh oh, <laughs> Well, it's fine, Rick. Totally cool. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have anybody selling your wine here. And I do try to buy local as much as I can. Oh, yeah, that worked, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Waboosh! Hit Nick and Lori <laughs> at the same time! <laughs> oh, no, no. Let's get back to points. All right, let's get back to points. Um, what's the point? I, well, at, the po at this point, what's the point? I don't know. Can I, don't know. Can, can I make kind of a, a point back to what Rick was talking about earlier um, yes. and not drinking local? But, you know, there is a wine brand that uses points or scores as the their biggest marketing tool um, on every – bottle it says most awarded wine brand and that's because they enter every like county or city fair yeah. and so forth but barefoot ha is the most awarded wine brand and they use it at, i mean it's that's huge yeah i mean that yeah, stuff sells a lot Donut, do i'm like but it yeah. sells and i will tell you well, that as a winery, the amount of mail I get to enter competitions is, in, I mean, you, exactly. you know, Nick, right? It's, you could enter like five competitions a day, every day, oh, yeah. you know? Well, but there's an entry fee, isn't there? Of course. Uh, of course. Yes, yes. But you know what? It's honestly, if you're a big winery like Barefoot, it's nothing. It's like, I think, um, I think the San Francisco Chronicle is $85. You know, so if you're my wine competition's thirty five dollars. <laughs> well, it's a cash cow, right? Because people want because people want ratings. Yep. Or, I don't or know prizes. I, double gold, I, I'm that's well worth my eighty five dollars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but for all those who didn't get double gold <laughs> well we were silver we were so, last year. We were silver last year. Um you know, and it's, you know, we were proud of the, we were proud of the silver because, and that's one of the reasons why we enter the San Francisco Chronicle is because everybody doesn't get a medal there. Right. You know, and you know it, so it, I, I, I wasn't. So everybody ahead, doesn't get a trophy. That's right. No, but then that's why there's the Kenosha, you know, wine and hash festival or, you know. <laughs> Well, so I was I was a judge last year at the uh, Houston Livestock uh, Rodeo and Livestock Show, which is one of the biggest, apparently, uh, competitions in the country. And so I remember very distinctly that we tried forty, not tw well, two flights of twenty, Pinot Noirs from five to eleven dollars. Forty of them. Forty. And that's not okay. How many did you award medals to? I didn't award any, but <laughs> so but there there was there was pressure from our little group. Ah. Um, the the leader of the group said, "Well, we need to award at least a gold. Can you change your no medal to a silver? Can you change your silver to a gold?" Well, that's Can you kind change... of a huge jump. Wait a second, coming from somebody who runs a competition, if you're asking right. someone to do a no medal to a silver, that's a huge jump. I can right. see a bronze to a silver. Right, so the, that's, that's more accurate. Yeah. That's a more accurate representation, Debbie. But, um, so when, but when you taste 20, the, the, the pressure, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't pressure, pressure, but it was, I mean, it was, it was not negligible, was you have to award something. Pick the best of these. Um, and so, 
of the twenty of the two flights of twenty Pinot Noirs from five to eleven dollars, I I probably awarded a gold. I can't remember. I could check my notes if I could ever find them. Um, but it was so when I when I go in and I, this is not to diminish your double gold in any way, Lori, but I, I walk into a winery and I see all these medals around a wine. I think, what kind of pressure was there to give an award to somebody? Right. You know? And well, what, what, and going back to what you were saying, it, what award are they actually getting? Are they getting a gold medal at the, you know, Poochie Mama, Wama Wama thing, you know? <laughs> or, right. You know, like, or is it a legit, I don't know why I just said Hoochie Mama, Wama Wama. <laughs> I, I won a medal there once. <laughs> I think maybe that's because you're drinking orange looking wine. <laughs> but Nick, what was your medal for at the Hoochie Mama, Wama Wama? <laughs> that's a different podcast, Jeff. Different podcast. <laughs> Wait a minute. That requires him to pour water on that Merlot t-shirt. Exactly. But with all of the competitions, there are, there's, there's levels of quality yes. of competitions and. Sure. Like the, the decanter wine awards, I would say is the, you know, highest echelon of wine awards, you know, in, in my mind. And not everybody well, and, gets medal there. And, you and know. but Jeff, I mean, if you're, if you're evaluating 40, Five to twenty dollar Pinot Noirs. I mean, five to eleven. Five to eleven. Let's not get crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I just I mean, didn't know how they. Who, who were? Who was submitting five to eleven dollar Pinot Noirs? With the wineries, <laughs> barefoot. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's it's the wineries. So remember, I live in Texas too. So there's a, there's Texas wine industry is not insignificant. Okay. And I'm not saying it's good. But there are a lot of producers of Texas wines. I have yet to find one that I say, hmm, that's better than Pinotage. Um, <laughs> but, Jeff, was this, was, oh but was your, the wines that you tasted all Texas wines or was it in uh, We didn't know. We, did, we had no idea what they were. Okay. No idea. The only time that we could find out what we were tasting was if it won an award and I, I noted it uh, so that um so in our we were the only group there were a group of five or six of us that tasted the well we didn't just taste five to eleven dollar pinot noirs we had really good chardonnays too so i mean you can't give you can't live on five to eleven dollar chardonnay alone or a pinot noir alone um but so if I, I i noted which one won the double gold and then i could go go back to my notes once the results came out and say oh that was that wine but i have no idea what the 38 other ones that didn't win an award were. I have no idea. Which so is good. In, is, go ahead. Red. No, I was going to say, so the one that got double gold, was that a surprise to you? Um, so how did it get double gold? You you bowed down and gave it a gold medal? I can't, so, I, I cannot envision the Jeff I know bowing down. So I, this was a year and a half ago, and um, I like to claim early onset. So um, I'm not entirely sure how it went. I mean, when you're tasting that many, you w I'll speak for me. I, I want to find a good one. You, you, wanna f you don't want to say that you're just sitting around wasting your time drinking a bunch of schlock. Um, so I said, so I don't know if it was specifically with the, uh, the 5 to 11 Pinot Noirs, but you say, you know, this is the best one of the flight. And you could go back and they would let you taste them again. And, and so... The best one of the flight to me should win a gold medal, maybe, right? I mean, Agreed. one has to finish above the others. Yeah. Right? That that's what a competition's yeah. about. But um, then that goes against then that goes against judging tech the the techno, you know, this is techno technology wise sound. You know, or well, technology. So te technically te sound? Te yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, it's because I'm, I'm drinking water. No, I, I would agree with you, Lori, but at the same time, kind of uh, to Jeff's point is, you know, you have to base it on the category. You can't judge, you know, a $5 Pinot Noir against even a $15 Pinot Noir. So, you know, does it deliver or can you? Or, or can or, you? I mean, you, you could, I suppose. But I mean, that's why there's these price categories. And so you do have to judge within, you know, that bracket. 
Except and that's, that double but that's gold where five dollar pino, that double gold five dollar pino is got the same metal that a double gold thirty five dollar right. pino has. Right, and so that's what it. they're not doing. They're not. They're not saying this is a five dollar bottle of Pinot Noir, and for five dollar Pinot Noirs, this one gets the gold. But you know what? If I if I'm if I'm a wine consumer, just a general wine consumer, and my budget is you know five to eleven dollars, or um, you know, that's what I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna go for. You know, if I have a, a larger budget and I see a fifteen dollar Pinot Noir with you know a double gold and a five dollar, most I mean I would hope that a lot of people would say okay. I'm going to splurge a little bit more um, than five dollars. But if they both have this, if they both have the same perceived value in their metal, if a double gold means double gold, and there is no <laughs> distinction between the price of the five dollar oh, and the fifty dollar, oh, yeah. the person going to say, "Why do I need to spend that extra ten dollars? I can get a double gold for five. No, well, so I. I Rick, to your point, first, it looks like you're running with scissors over there. So just take I know, it easy. Man, yes. just, I got to I gotta take them, put them away. You, you're you're <laughs> having an earthquake wall. over there and you got it's scissors. It's not my wall from blowing. <laughs> but um, I, I do believe, and I, I can't say for certain, but I'm 80. Oh, 80 there it goes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> I predicted an earthquake. I'm like Nostradamus. You are or right. Oh my God, the earthquake has happened. Okay, we're, uh, <laughs> we're back in business. Lori, that's just a little excitement for the show. I do apologize. I, I, it's kind of like but when I you're on. Say, what differentiates the $5.99 bottle of wine that got the 90 points and the $15 bottle of wine. That well, so I was, I was about to say. I mean, are they, are they not scored on the same merit? Like, you know, Claire, you know. We use w the AWS right. 20, 20 points. So. No, so I don't think. Go ahead, Jeff. So w w for for me, it was they said you, these are the these are the wines. We were to choose the winners from this category. And to Rick's point, I, I do believe when the scores came, or the or the results came out, it was they had the categories. So it wasn't just here are our double gold Pinot Noir winners. It was here's our five to eleven dollar Pinot Noir award winners. Here are our whatever the next jump was. I think it was eleven to twenty, and then twenty to whatever. So, um, but having said that, I don't think they say, which was my approach. This is not as piss poor as the rest. Right. Right. right? Well, that that was my judging criteria. Is like I have to find. A shiny piece of shit. I say that in the rough. Right. That's a better way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> I like a shining piece of shit better myself. <laughs> so, well, that's the difference. I mean, <laughs> Diamond in the rough, female, you know. Exactly. You know, but when you go to a grocery store, I think most consumers, and again, this is just me, you know, thinking, um, you have a set budget. And so somebody who only has the budget for five to ten dollars might look for that gold medal. Somebody who can afford or wants to afford something larger is not going to go with that five dollar pino. That's why, you know, when you're seeing them on the shelf, usually they're within some sort of like price brackets yeah. in a retail in a retail you need to drop a little lower on the level of shelving to find the five ninety nine. Absolutely. And so, you know, somebody who can't afford, you know, the pre the ultra premium or premium wine, you know, category is not going to go shopping and doesn't care about that gold, double gold on the $5. Yeah, I just, I just don't, um, you know, we've walked in to wineries and, and, you know, like you said, barefoot or not that I've walked into barefoot, but like wineries like barefoot that have all of those metals, you know, they've got their bottle there with all of their metals and all of that stuff. And then you, you got to look through what those metals really are. You know, I just, I just, 
I mean, I'm proud of, I think San Francisco Chronicle is a highly, um, you know, recognized competition and uh, respected competition. And that's really the only competition that we, we submit to. Um, and again, I want to underscore, I wasn't, I didn't say that to dem demean or diminish no, or no, I, no, I otherwise agree. impugn. Um, but, but when, when I, it's kind of like we were talking about before, if someone says this is a 92 and I think it was Nick that brought it up, well, well what does that mean? Who right. are you? And do I align with what you say? And so, but when I see double gold, I say, well, congratulations. I, I hope that's helped you. But being who I am, I'm, I'd rather taste it and decide for myself if I think, you know, that I want to purchase it or I can recommend it or whatever. Right. So. so with that, that's like perfect because my, my next question is ignoring the whole this is a specific point or this is a specific metal. Is there anybody who you follow because they do you've realized over the times of tasting wine that they actually do have a similar palate to you? Or is it vice versa where there's somebody who because Mike and I, and again, I won't say names. Mike and I, we know that a person who rates wines, and if they say it's like a ninety-five, we stay away from it because their palate is so off from what our palate is. So, do you have people that you follow or pay attention to their wines because you're similar to their palate, or you know their palate is completely opposite? Yes. Uh, no. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, man. Yeah, I finished with my yes. I was good. I've, I've, you know, the people that I follow, and sometimes we taste the same wine, and we don't have the same experiences. And I'll be like, "How on earth did you get that?" And I'm like, "I got totally different end of the spectrum, as did my husband." And we're sitting there looking, and it's like the guy is nuts. He's, you know, he's doing it because he likes the winery owner or he's got a relationship with them or whatever well i think you bring up a good point debbie because it, that's difficult i pointed out the skewest wine that i was drinking tonight and they're really nice people and so when i value up their wine it's it's not just what's in the bottle it's the experiences that i've had with uh hank and, and maggie i mean it has to come into play we we live we can't live in a completely objective world which the W set, the whole scoring thing, I would like to talk about that later if we have time. But going, going back to it, there's a, a friend of mine, I, I would say a pretty good friend of mine, who, another wine writer, who, gives, who will not give anything below a 93. And I don't know why that is. I've never asked him or her about it. Um, but it just seems like, and I, I don't know if this is where you were going with it, Debbie, but this person likes the attention of wineries sending him or her samples of being invited on trips. And so if you, um, personally, I won't write about something if let's just say for the sake of argument, it's below 86 or 85, 86, 85. I mean, there's too much good wine in the world to say, you know what, this is a mediocre wine. Mm -hmm. So, but this person, doesn't publish anything that's under a 93. Well, then I think it, that their credibility, and I, maybe, Lori, this is a whole nother topic uh, for something like, for, for this discussion, but that, that comes into a credibility issue. So, Jeff, does that mean that this person, if, if that person rates it a 93, it's equivalent to somebody else's 85, or... Well, I, I don't know, but, but the, the, the reason I point that out is, is I, I follow their, um, uh, casually, their, their writing about it, but I often see the ratings on the winery websites. And so is it to draw, is, is it not only, which was my first perception, was to keep the golden goose alive, but also to drive more traffic to the website because, oh, let's go check out the website because it's right here, the, the, the ratings are on. I mean, you're more likely to put a 95 on your website than a 90. That's just, I mean, I understand that. 
um, or obviously above an 88. So is this person inflating the scores for a reason other than honestly evaluating the wines? I mean, how many 95 point wines are there in the world? Right. I, I mean, by definition, there's, right? That's the top 5%. 5%. So, right. Um, so, so to me, then do those, ratings do those points mean anything i don't know i mean if, if i were to ask this person i'm sure i would get the response oh no that's i mean i'm not going to challenge i wouldn't challenge it's a him his uh, uh or hers or hers it's it's a him um i wouldn't challenge his reasons for doing it because i mean again you know the wine industry is full of cool people Doing, I mean, they're, they're making a beverage for your enjoyment. I mean, why be a jerk about stuff? You know, I mean, that's, which is why I don't publish stuff that, yeah, I, I published one bad review. It was actually pretty funny, but it was, it was a bad review. But I, I surprisingly never received another sample from that wine company. <laughs> Who shall go on name? It, it was not Jordan. It was not Jordan. It was not Jordan. Well, I mean, I, I don't assign points to anything and I don't feel like I have the credentials to really honestly assign points to anything. To me, it's whether I like it or I don't. But one of the wines that I recently tasted that came at the recommendation of one of the stores that I frequent quite a bit, um, I didn't like at all. I went back to the store and said to the person, Tell me what it was about this wine that you liked, because I didn't get very much from it that I found pleasing. <laughs> and we talked what about was the it. response. It was a great. I had a similar. I had a similar um, experience. She said, "Well, what did you get?" And I said, "I got all mineral, all minerality, all acid, and not a lick of fruit." And she said, "Exactly. That's what I love." And wow. I was it a columbard? No, no. <laughs> but it was, um, you know, but I'm like, okay. So I'll be able to put that wine on my blog and say, hey, I tried it. It wasn't for me. It didn't have the profile of a wine that I'm going to drink. But If you're looking to remove all the enamel from your teeth, this is the one for you. This is the one for <laughs> you. And I know people that nice. like this wine, right? So... I don't know. I mean, which to me gets back to the whole point thing. The points have a different value to different players in the industry. Mm -hmm. And it is subjective. There is a, the, the community is large, but it's not huge. So you're part of a community. And I'm sorry, I'm seeing a dog's butt. I was going to say, uh, Rick, do you have a dog behind that wall? Because why well, I do. Do you see? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Get your butt out of here. <laughs> hey, I always do try to provide an entertainment break during every <laughs> podcast, okay? Come here, Bruce, girl. Come here. Up here. He's just Come hanging here. out there. <laughs> Let's say hi to everybody. Come here. Come I think on. he lifted his tail at some point. You might want to step carefully. <laughs> Come on. Here we go. Everybody say hi to Breezy. Oh. <laughs> She's a good girl. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, hey, it's a very um, active brick wall tonight. <laughs> yeah. Breezy. Yeah. No, I, Rick, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I would just say kind of because uh, looking at the clock, um, I guess we're about to wrap it up, but to me, points are a jumping off point. And so, you know, that it's kind of like, it's a long story that I don't have to recount here, but somebody somewhere like this wine. So that means this wine is likable. And so that's a good starting point for me. If someone else liked it and, and, and to your point, Rick, and then I don't like it, I, I hope you don't go back to that person at your wine store and say, can you recommend something else? Because clearly your palates aren't connecting. Right. Exactly. Right. No, totally. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think that's the, I think that's the big takeaway from this is you just need to find the person 
points or medals or whatever are great if you find a person whose palette is somewhat aligned to your palette. And then, as Jeff said, it's a jumping point from there. It's, all right, well, I might like this wine. I might go in this direction because we have a similar palette. And like in so many other things, you know, in the wine business as well, you got to kiss a lot of frogs until you find your prince or princess. Right. So but I would also say, I would also say that so many wines today compared to even 20 years ago are technically good, right? You're not going to say, I mean, it's not, you might not like it. It might not go to your, your personal palate, but it's technically okay. It's not going to, it doesn't taste like, what we saw emerging from the, the behind the brick wall of, of, of Rick's room there. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sure she's a very sweet dog, but. I but couldn't drink 20 years ago, so I don't know what the wine was back then. But there, there's wines that oh, wow, you throw a little shade on my age there. there? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. There's, I there's could... wines that I review and you know, it's not liking to my palate, mm -hmm. but it's liking to somebody else's. And it could be because, you know, it might be a sweeter wine and I'm, I'm a dry person, mm -hmm. you know, but if that person likes things more on the fruitier side or the sweeter side, they will like that. Absolutely. You know, who am I to judge? Because I don't, you know, I don't particularly care for stuff like that. Who am I to judge? Because the people that, you know, read what I write, they might like that. Right. Well, you are to judge. You're a wine critic. You're a wine writer. Yeah. You're respected. And you, you know, so you are to judge. True. I guess I am. Yeah. You are so to judge people then who have found that they have a similar palette to you will read you and go, yes, I'm going to buy that. Or, you know, or I'm no, gonna I'm not going to buy that. Right. I'm gonna or I know somebody that likes that and going to tell that person, right. this is something right. they need to try. Right. Right. Well, we are, as I thought, this would be a very kind of heated conversation and the hour has gone rather quickly. Um, so I'm uh, going Riddle to- Riddle time. What? Riddle. Riddle time. Riddle time. Oh, jeez. I hate uh, this. The answer, the, answer is, the answer is wink.com. Go there. Check it out. Try wink. $22. Slash wrap up. That's what it is. Wrap up. Wrap up. Okay. With a W, or do I need to wear a backwards baseball cap? Is that <coughs> wrap up? All right. Never the thinking cap, the rally cap. Yeah. Okay. Does that mean I need to finish my bottle of wine before we close? No. And open the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that right. the wall falls falls on me one more time. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Ready? What must be in your oven yet cannot be baked? Grows in the heat, yet shuns the light of day. What sinks in water, but rises in air, looks like skin, but is fine as hair. Mold. Yeast. <laughs> Steam. Yeast. Yeast. Ta-da! I'm not going to lie, I haven't been keeping track, even though I said I was going to keep track. Uh, <laughs> that's two, Rick, right? Is that your I statement? believe it is. That's two. Nick has got the first two. one, right? Yep. So I should start writing it down. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm expecting a, a ribbon with 95 points on it. <laughs> okay, that, that's true. That's true. We'll, we'll, we'll have Rick, to... Rick could just tag up that wall behind him. Just make sure. Oh, so but yes. Don't very forget good. to tip your servers next show at 11. <laughs> and Debbie mold, you know, that that was good. That was good. If you have mold in your oven, there's a problem. That yes. is. I don't know. I was just like thinking about stuff. It's like, oh my God. Like mold. Debbie, that invite to your house for dinner, I'm going to take a hard pass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll eat at the restaurant, just... Jeff. <laughs> hey, does that restaurant serve Jordan wine? <laughs> no, it's a BYO. <laughs> All right, so let's let's take one minute each and uh, do your shameless little plugs. We'll go uh, the other direction. Rick, you're up first. 
All right, my name is Rick Dean. I am from Strong Coffee to Red Wine. That's the name of my blog. Um, and I just have a lot of fun talking about wines I like and occasionally wines I don't that other people like. Um, food and a little bit of Charleston. So thank you very much for having me today. Thank you. And Nick. So I am wine calm guy, C-O-M-M. -M. It's mainly because I like to talk a lot. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and at winecomguy.com. Jeff? Uh, Jeff Kralik, the Drunken Cyclist. Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, far too many social media outlets. <laughs> I, I hate social media, but I'll try to be cheery when you contact me there. Um, I have a big uh, rosé tasting coming up, a true rosé tasting, which is uh, non saigné uh, intentional rosé, in a couple weeks, so uh, stay tuned for the results of that. Awesome. And Debbie? I'm Debbie Giaquino, the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, and you can find me at HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com, and I'm on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and all those social media channels, Google+, Plus, whatever. You can all find right, so, me. All right, Debbie, I, or Lori, excuse me, let me come back because I didn't mention any of my social media. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I'm on all of them. Coffee to Red Wine on Twitter and, and Instagram. <laughs> Strong coffee to red wine. That wasn't my dog. Um, on that was my dog. She's a vicious attack dog. And okay. I think there was a wind outside that she wanted to attack. All right. And lastly, I'm Lori. I'm your host. And thank you for joining Wine Riders Wrap Up. And uh, we do this once a month. And um, again, Shameless plug, here we go, number three, four, five, I don't know, trywink.com forward slash wrap up to get $22 off. And our next wrap up is going to be on Monday, June 11th. And hey, hey, hey. this is the first this time is Sebastian. live. Hi, Sebastian. Hey, Sebastian. How does it feel to be famous? Sebastian fame. How does it feel to so be famous? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> he can't, Sebastian can't hear anything, and so he's doing, okay, say good. Now, say good. <laughs> no, I unplugged, so. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. You, you're, how old are you now, Sebastian? Um, nine. Nine. So I, I feel like I've known you for like the last five years. <laughs> Where are all your See. aunts and uncles out here? You don't know us, but we know you. <laughs> are, are you are you angry that dad talks about you every week? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> what a ham. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> it doesn't fall far from the tree. Right, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Wow. Have you sabered yet? If he sabered when I, no. But he's filmed a lot of the sabering. Yes, yesterday. we. <laughs> he's the master behind film the it. camera. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so our next wrap up is going to be June 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern time, and it is going to be bias against packaging. What's your thoughts on how you Ooh. package wine? Ooh, that's a good Ooh. one. All right. So thanks everybody for joining. Have a thank you. great week. Thanks, Lori. And thanks, thanks, Lori. Hey, right. thanks, oh. Lori. Have Bye. a great one. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. -bye. Bye.